Okay. Um, so Lockie, do you want to get us started? Yep, sure. Okay. So I think we did a progress update relatively recently. So this is mainly just covering some of the newer stuff, but basically we are the Monash um, Data Science and AI Megathrust team, that's Lex and I, um, and we're working with our supervisor, Mitch, and the researchers, Fabio, Tiagi, and Yuan from uh, Merck. Oh, I think you're, there you go. I think you're on the wrong presentation. But, uh, um, oh, oh, am I? Uh, wait, oh, I can quickly switch no, over. It's, it's okay. We can just do the whole thing, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so basically the overall goal of the project is to be able to use deep learning to uh, essentially learn new things about the characteristics and the relationships between um, the like the geophysical characteristics of like the earth and the uh, level or like the magnitude of earthquakes and that can occur in a given region given those characteristics so the goal is basically to get a to see how well a machine learning algorithm can then learn it and then see how it learned it to kind of um, do things like learn which features are more important and stuff like that. So the, yeah, the main challenge is just essentially is just the extremely imbalanced data set. Um, the main earthquakes we're looking for or we're most interested in are the mega earthquakes, um, which occur at a magnitude above eight. Uh, but just for the sake of this uh, getting as much data as possible, we just have it set to seven. So. Of the 15,000-ish uh, samples we have available in the data set, only about 300 of them are above a 7. I think it's about 30 or so are above an 8, and then we have 3 above a 9 magnitude earthquake. So it's very difficult to kind of uh, do much with such an imbalanced data set. So the main solutions we have for that are the uh, we do some label smoothing, which just makes the, the model a little less confident in its answers and tries to prevent it from overfitting too much. Um, we've tried recently some linear interpolation to kind of artificially increase the amount of data we have. Um, we also adjust the sampling rates so that uh, we're undersampling some of the more overrepresented overrepresented uh, data and oversampling uh, the data we don't have much of, so like the mega earthquakes. And then, uh, as I think we've previously mentioned in a different update, we also implemented uh, K-folds cross-validation just to kind of get a more accurate representation of how uh, the model's performing. So if you wanna go ahead here, let's. Yeah, sure. Um, so as a quick, I guess, yeah, recap of what we started with. Um, so we're building off the work of previous interns, uh, Ravindu and Darren. And what we were given was like a sort of stock standard fully connected network, um, which is great for our purposes because we just need something which is, I mean, easy to train. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's interpretable. And by that, we mean we can, assuming we get a model that has like a high enough accuracy to be interesting, um, we can then use certain techniques to uh, determine which input features are considered important for the different categories that we're interested in. So for example, um, what input variables, uh, I guess, are biased more towards great earthquakes than for regular earthquakes? And hopefully that'll help the researchers find um, the differences in the phenomena. Um, so yeah, as Lockie said, um, this uh, we were randomly sampling data to begin with, which again, just overcomes that data imbalance. Um, the model had like a categorical and a continuous prediction um, and it already had label smoothing. Okay, so as for what Lockie and I have done, um, we would have talked about some of these in, yeah, previous presentations, I guess. But um, again, as a quick summary, uh, we included geographical neighbors in the input space, um, which we've actually scrapped recently because we realized um, that was leading to data leakage. Because just because you're looking at a, an earthquake, say, let's say great earthquake, for an example, it's you're almost certain in that case that all the earthquakes around it are probably not also great earthquakes. They're probably just regular or even worse, they're small earthquakes. So even though you're looking at a great earthquake as your sort of uh, target, you're, you're introducing a lot of sort of noisy data around it. Um, not that it seemed to really affect the accuracy too much, but it's more about the principle than, than the results. Um, again, as Lockie already mentioned, yeah. 
Uh, we've added k-folds cross validation, basically just to make sure our results actually are statistically significant. Um, recently, we've added linear interpolation, which I'll get into in a second. And we've also changed the label smoothing, which I'll also get into in a second. Um, and lastly, we've sort of moved away from a single model um, to basically a sort of binary tree of models. Um, but Lockie will get into that um, towards the end. So with the label smoothing, um, originally it was set up such that the model was penalized equally for pretty much any incorrect prediction. So if it incorrectly predicted a regular earthquake when something was in fact a great earthquake, um, we applied a certain loss to that. Um, and if, if it did it the other way around, we'd apply that exact same loss. But we realized recently that this is sort of um, just not very valid because we have the issue where not only is our data imbalanced, um, but we only have the data up until this point in time. So, and I, I guess we didn't say this too specifically before. So as a quick reminder, our data is basically, we have like a grid, we have multiple grids of points in like physical space on the earth around subduction zones. Um, and for each point, we have the highest magnitude of earthquake that has happened there. Um, and I guess the key word being happened in the past. So just because a particular point may only have had a regular earthquake happen at worst, that's not to say that a great earthquake can't happen there in the future. Which means if our model predicts a great earthquake for a spot which we only know has had a regular earthquake, we can't actually penalize it as much as we were before because we don't actually know that the model is wrong. Um, whereas if we do it in the other direction, if the model predicts a regular earthquake, but we do know that a great earthquake has happened there, then we can say with certainty that the model is wrong for that. So we actually apply more loss in that case. Um, so, and actually I was talking about this with one of my friends and he sort of mentioned the, um, the black swan problem, um, or I think the, white crow is like another sort of logical, not fallacy, but um, issue, I guess. Um, but yeah. And, and another thing we've added recently is that linear interpolation. Um, and th currently this is being used with the random sampling. So under sampling the regular earthquakes and over sampling the great earthquakes. Um, but we might actually try just replacing that and see if that works. But it's basically just a, a sort of form of data augmentation. Um, so the technique we're using is, it's a pretty ambiguous name, but it's a synthetic minority oversampling technique. But it's basically, you find the nearest neighbors in the input space for each point. Um, and you just linearly interpolate between those nearest neighbors. So the idea being that your input variables are very similar um, to points which are already in your data. Um, so hopefully they're still physically meaningful. Um, yeah, with, without sort of being too wacky, because we do have to be careful about doing something like this. One of the reasons we have to be careful is the, the clustering in our input space is not very neat. So the great earthquakes don't necessarily sort of cluster together um, as much as we would like them to. So if you just look at nearest neighbors, I've, I've sort of they're not great graphs, but they represent the point well enough. Um, if you just look at nearest neighbors, then you sort of get a graph like in the top where it looks like you have a lot of choices for interpolating between. But then if you actually filter out all the ones which only um, connect great earthquakes together, which are the ones we want to generate, so we only want to interpolate between those, um, that really minimizes your options and leaves us with the graph on the bottom. Oops. Um, which again, it's not a great graph, but you can basically just see there are a lot less dots, which is, which is the key thing, um, which makes the interpolation a bit sort of shakier for our use case. Um, and, and yeah, we haven't really got any like hard and fast results from that yet. So yeah. Okay. Cool. So the just most recent uh, thing we've been working on is the idea of like a binary tree model. So we're trying to take the problem from a multi-classification problem 
uh, and turn it into two separate binary classification uh, problems. So, because we found that the original model would get really good at kind of predicting between either like regular and great earthquakes or uh, would get good at between like no earthquake and regular earthquake. So we thought we'll just split it into two separate binary models and train them separately. So the idea is that we've taken the data set and we found the mean uh, and so roughly 5.5 uh, magnitude and just split that into two separate data sets and then trained uh, two separate binary classification models um, with either the first model is trying to predict between uh, no earthquakes and regular earthquakes and then the second model is trying to predict between regular earthquakes and mega earthquakes. Um, right now it's not fully implemented so we don't have any um, you know, like great results to share or anything like that, but that's basically the most recent uh, update. And, you know, we're expecting to get better results from it um, in the future, I guess, than what we were in the past. And that's basically it for now. So any questions? If there's no questions, anyone? Sorry, yeah, I just had a um, question on the, um, you said there was like a, a layer-wise linear interpolation. What was it called for finding the, for the interpretability of your, of your models? So, so that, I think that was the layer-wise relevance propagation. Yeah, um, that sounds a lot more like it. <laughs> um, and I'll be honest, like I haven't looked at it since the start of semester because <laughs> But before we want to do that, we want sort of good models, which we're still struggling to get. But um, uh, if you're asking about how that works, basically I've forgotten, but it's from memory, it sounded sort of similar to back propagation. Yeah, yeah. I, I've done a quick Google now. It looks like, yeah, fancy back propagation. Yeah, you pretty um, much just what, go from the output layer back to the start and you, yeah, you add up all the biases or something. I can't quite remember. Yeah, sure. So I guess the question is mostly like, so so you have that which is which is fantastic um that's that's very new and very cool how, how is that actually useful for you in the project so say that like you do have your trained model and you have and then you can apply this thingy bob um <laughs> that wonderful technique that that has a name mm. um how do you actually use that in this particular project like how is that useful so i guess in terms of what lucky and i are doing it's completely like useless to us like it doesn't improve the model um but it's for Yuan and Tiagi. So, and especially now that we have the two models, hopefully what we'll find is we have the sort of lower model, the one which distinguishes between like no earthquakes and regular earthquakes. And hopefully we can get that to a good accuracy. We can get it to around like 70%, which isn't great, but not terrible. Um, so hopefully we get that to a good accuracy. It learns some sort of patterns in the input space. And then we have the, the higher, arguably more interesting model, which distinguishes between regular earthquakes and great earthquakes. And again, hopefully we get that to a certain level of accuracy, which means it, it recognizes some patterns in the input space. And then Yuan and Tiagi can come in and use that technique to interpret both of those models. Um, and basically look at the differences in which variables are contributing to like which results in both models. Because I guess what they're trying to find is are great earthquakes the result of like a different phenomena to regular earthquakes? Um, or are they just like an amplification of the same phenomenon? Yeah, sure. And then you use those, I, I guess those um, uh, feature relevance or importance techniques to find out if they are caused by the same features yeah, exactly. or if they're caused by different features. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that, that makes lots of sense. Thanks. That's a good question. Awesome. Just keeping time in mind, we might jump to the MMS team now. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, Lucky. Uh, yep, I will just share my screen. Uh, is that all good? Alrighty, so hello everyone. Um, we are here to give you an update on the Motorsport CFD team. Um, so hopefully you guys all know who we are by now, but mainly for the recording, I'll give a quick introduction. 
So the team consists of Darren, Patrick and myself. Um, this is a collaboration project between Deep Neuron and Monash, Monash Motorsport um, to assist them in their CFD workflow. Um, Motorsport have for a couple of years now or many years now um, put their designs through ANSYS Fluent which outputs a lot of useful variables that help them predict how well a car may perform, such as drag, lift, and center of pressure. And over the years, they've built up a great data set for us um, in that we can take their inputs um, and, and their outputs and try and, we're gonna try and make a model that will approximate that output relatively well, which will save them a lot of time, hopefully. Um, currently, we are just trying to output these um, variables for the over the over the whole car. So the overall net drag, net lift, and net center of pressure. Um, I will now pass it over to Patrick. Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah. So in terms of where we left off from the last meeting, um, we talked about mesh CNN. Uh, so mesh, there's a couple of options out there when you want to do mesh based neural nets or 3D neural nets. Primarily PyTorch 3D is something we were looking at. Um, and now we've been looking at mesh CNN, which is built on PyTorch. Um, and that sort of gives us some options out of the box for handling these mesh inputs. Um, it's not particularly well documented and there's not in general a lot of good documentation out there. So we've mostly been relying on the various different research papers. Um, but there's something enough to work through. Um, and we were also looking at the valid versus invalid data out of the data set that we've been given from Monash Motorsport. Um, that was kind of, it took a lot longer than we had expected it would take because we had to analyze which data we could actually use and which we couldn't. Um, and sometimes those differences were more subtle than you might think. Um, for example, some of the models were missing various uh, pieces of the cars uh, that meant that they couldn't be sort of uh, boiled down into the format that mesh CNN wanted. Uh, so there's lots of HPC style processing there um, and using a lot of um, slurm and, and so on with the um, with their massive infrastructure. Uh, one issue we did run into was that the edge counts on the data set. So if you look at the um, the image of a 3D model in the top right corner there, um, you can see each of those lines there represents an edge um, in the mesh. And the, the edge counts in our data set vary from about 100,000 up to 1 million, which is a big difference uh, between the smallest and the largest. And um, with neural networks, you generally want to have pretty homogenous inputs uh, in terms of the size of them. So that makes things a little bit diff difficult. The other thing that's difficult is that mesh CNN was not designed to work on meshes this large. It was really designed on about 1,000 um, edge meshes. Um, and so, so far it's been holding up, but they potentially might run into some issues in terms of memory usage and things like that. Um, so our current goal is to get a model where we can take in a mesh as an input and output just a single parameter. Uh, so we want to know what the drag is, and that will sort of serve as a proof of concept for the rest of the parameters that we want to calculate. Um, and that re requires adjusting one of the examples that comes with mesh CNN, um, which is a classification based, based model. Um, and we want to adjust that to basically take the last layer, swap it out for a regression layer um, and output a regression value to estimate what the drag is. Uh, so that's where we're at now. Well, we're about to talk about where we're, where we're at now. That was sort of where we were uh, last week, last, last time we presented. All righty. So yeah, where we're at now, just to kind of give you guys an idea of the, the hurdles we're working with. Um, so yeah, as Patrick mentioned, our, our data set is kind of huge um, compared to what mesh CNN was built on. Um, so we are currently, well, Darren just this last week actually got a smaller data set together so we can practice, well, adapt the model and work on that to get through all the errors. Um, because we found that training, trying to debug and rearrange the model on our actual data took uh, longer than, 10 15 minutes just to get an error so yeah this smaller data set will hopefully make our workflow quicker um, another error that we've come across is that it's suggesting that our meshes or some of our meshes at least might not be manifold so looking at the image in the bottom right um, there's some examples of non-manifold geometry so for mesh cnn 
it requires, it's based on the assumption that every single edge in the mesh will have only two adjacent uh, faces. So this one in this example here obviously has three, which is not physically possible for us. Um, but yeah, we've been doing some checking to make sure that our meshes don't have that kind of um, non-manifold um, type. Um, and yeah, we're, we're still trying to modify the classification example into regression and we are making good use of the VS code debugger. Um, we've gotten pretty adept at that. Um, I believe I will now pass on to Darren to talk about the future steps. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sam. So in terms of our next steps, we'll be continuing our efforts into using the classification example available on MeshCNN, the one that Patrick mentioned, uh, to build a regression model. So once everything's running, we'll, try, we'll be training it so that it can show uh, some semblance to an accuracy that we're all familiar with. And then we'll also be looking to upgrade the model uh, to output all necessary values that the one that Sam mentioned about the drag, the lift and the center of pressure. So we'll be upgrading it to produce all three outputs rather than just one of it. And then finally, we'll be tweaking the hyperparameters and maybe run some sweeps to see whether we can improve our model, uh, but that's pretty far ahead. And also at the bottom, we can see some actual footage of Sam when he gets the mesh CNN working correctly. <laughs> yeah, and that's about it from us. Yeah, um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free. Um, yeah, firstly, I, I love the, the what's it? It's like the confidence pose thing that you're supposed to do for a job interview, um, little mesh thing of Sam, uh, that's awesome. Um, secondly, how are, are you using the, the same model architecture on the um, sample data set that you will be on the, the real one, or is it just the same, the same style of network, but much smaller? Um, so currently, we're just trying to go with what they've got, but realistically, to get any kind of good results, we're going to have to modify it to make it a lot bigger, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, sure. Because the, the very first layer in the network is a big pooling layer, which pulls it to um, well, seeing as they worked on like roughly a thousand edge meshes, I think it pulls it to like 700 or something. So going from a million to 700 is very infeasible, um, yep. I'm guessing. So yeah, at the moment we're rolling with it, but in the future, we're definitely going to have to change it. Yeah, sure. Sure. Checks out. No, thanks for that. 